Colgate University. For videos, podcasts, and other digital resources, visit colgate.edu slash colgateconversations. What did you uh, discover? Well, I was looking uh, in the collection at the Picker to see if I could find anything in their medieval collection, such as it is, that I might be interested in using uh, in a course I'm teaching this semester on medieval art. So last spring, in preparation for that course, uh, I went to the database in the Picker collection itself uh, and was sort of poking around in there, seeing what I could find, did not have high hopes. I'd always been told that there isn't much ancient art and very little, really very little pre-modern art uh, in the Picker collection at all. So I went with low expectations and sure enough, the medieval collection had a couple of odds and ends in it that might be useful in the classroom. But in the course of poking around and doing those searches, uh, at a certain point, just to see what came up, I set the parameters very wide for the date. I said, anything, show me anything from the year zero to the year 1400. Uh, and all of this late antique Egyptian material came up that I had never heard about before, that I had no idea was in the picker. A whole series of textiles, uh, and especially exciting to me were these 20 late antique figural reliefs carved in marble, clearly from some kind of architectural uh, environment. They look like they may have been you know, gone around at the, at the cornice level of some building. Uh, depicting animals and birds and all kinds of creatures uh, in a series of vine scrolls, acanthus scrolls, which is a pretty common motif that we find in the classical and late antique world. Uh, so I was very excited about that. Um, I wondered where these objects were, and when I scrolled down to find the location for them, uh, I was quite surprised to discover that they were all being stored in the Hamilton Movie Theater, uh, which I immediately went down with the director of the gallery, Lynn Underhill, to go have a look at, uh, look at this particular storage facility. Uh, and sure enough, tucked away among the old exhibition catalogs and various odds and ends from the museum's history were these packages of bubble wrap, and in the bubble wrap were these reliefs, which were quite delightful to discover. Uh, Lynn immediately realized that these deserve to, do, to be in a place that was somewhat more dignified than the Hamilton Movie Theater basement, so we moved them out uh, and brought them up to the picker. And in fact, they're now being quite lovingly cared for. Special cases have been made to house each one of them. Uh, and Patricia Jew has been doing an analysis of the material as well to help us figure out exactly what these are. Uh, so yes, it was a very exciting discovery. And how, how did these pieces come to the Picker collection? That's a good question. It was uh, part of the Meyer bequest. Herbert Meyer is a Colgate uh, alum who was a major collector and gallery owner focusing primarily on contemporary art in New York City in the 1960s. He was a big player in the contemporary art scene there. Marianne Kahlo has done a lot of work on his gallery and his collection, uh, and in particular his very generous bequest to Colgate. There was recently a big exhibit at the Picker showcasing some of the many, many works that he donated to us. Uh, but he had ideas that were kind of au courant in the 1960s about you know, kind of universal impulses in the creation of art. So he saw real affinities between the rejection of kind of classicism and naturalism that was, you know, that are part of 20th century art, and then what these late antique artists were doing back in the 4th and 5th centuries AD, where that also was a moment when a kind of deeply rooted classical tradition was slowly being overturned and replaced uh, with art making impulses that were clearly trying to do something quite different than represent the human being in its you know, perfectly naturalistic forms. So he saw a real affinity between what artists like de Kooning were doing and what these late antique Egyptian sculptors were doing. Uh, so when he was in Cairo, in the 1960s, he was in some gallery there uh, in the city itself uh, and had the opportunity to buy these 20 relief sculptures. He had no idea where exactly they came from. This was not the kind of question that was being asked very carefully back then. So he purchased these 20 reliefs and brought them to his gallery in New York City. Uh, yeah, it seems that uh, from, the, from the fact that two of them have frames, frames on them, 
uh, it seems likely that those were probably the two that he actually had on view in the gallery at some point. Uh, but the rest of them look like they were never shown, uh, either in the context of his gallery and then certainly not in the course of their life at Colgate. There's some question I know in the news about the age, ages of these kinds of works and how the ages are determined. Um, what do you know about these pieces in particular? It's a very good question and something that has to be handled with great uh, care and thoroughness per for all works of ancient art, but especially in the case of late antique Egyptian material, which was a real kind of booming field uh, in the 1960s and 70s, and the demand far exceeded the supply at that point. So we know that there was a very active culture of forgery uh, of these pieces around that time. Uh, there was a big exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum a couple of years ago called Unearthing the Truth, uh, where they put on display about 30 of their objects that they purchased right around the same time that Meyer purchased ours. Um, and they came to the conclusion that 10 of their pieces were forgeries and 20 of them were good. Um, so this is a kind of work that's being you know, done very carefully now in the field. Uh, and we do have some ways of assessing this from a scientific standpoint. I mean, they will get us so far, they won't take us all the way to a definitive answer. But for example, one thing that Patricia Jew has been able to ascertain is that the particular type of limestone that these uh, that these reliefs are carved in uh, is not the kind of limestone that the forgeries were carved in. So it doesn't have any of those kind of chemical signatures that would indicate that the stone came from a quarry that wasn't in use in antiquity. So we can at least eliminate a kind of immediate uh, uh, branding of the works as a forgery. I mean, the, the reality is we can never be certain, uh, especially when we're dealing with works that weren't discovered in an excavated context, right? With any work that surfaces on the art market, there's never a possibility of having a kind of black and white certainty uh, about their authenticity. But I have shown these pieces, I've shown photographs of them to scholars in the field, and they did not think that they looked like the forgeries. They thought they looked genuine. Um, and in fact, the, one of the scholars I showed them to pinpointed them to a particular uh, to a particular city in late antique Egypt and I gave them a particular date, 4th or 5th century CE, uh, from a city called Oxyrhynchus. Does this, the, the discovery of this work, take your personal scholarship in a new direction? Um, it does in that it's really forcing me to put my money where my mouth is. Uh, I mean, my, my own research is not focused on late antique Egypt. I work on uh, works that are a little bit earlier and are focused primarily on uh, in, imperial context, so in the city of Rome. Um, but the project I'm working on right now is actually focused directly on uh, this larger epistemological problem that these objects represent. So one of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is what we can do with works uh, that surface on the art market and how we should handle these as scholars and what our responsibilities are and what the limitations are. For a very long time, my field has um, really not differentiated very sharply between works that come from excavated contexts and works that don't. And the reasons why that hasn't been a very clear divide in the field has a lot to do with kind of the field's origins in the 18th and 19th century when almost nothing was coming out of the ground in excavated contexts, right? Everything was circulating on the art market then. That's when the big collections were formed. That's when all the most famous pieces sort of first became widely known. Uh, and the field is in many ways still very much rooted in its, um, you know, kind of 19th century form. So the book I'm writing right now is sort of meant to be a little bit of a prod to get my fellow uh, scholars to think a little bit more explicitly uh, about the difference between excavated and unexcavated work, uh, and in particular to be more self-conscious in the ways in which they talk about objects that surfaced on the art market. So to always remember to make a case for why we should believe a work is authentic, even if it's a work that's been famous for a hundred years, right? That doesn't necessarily mean it's ancient. Um, or authentic. Right, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, these are issues that I've been thinking about a lot. And, you know, I, I'm hoping at some point um, possibly to use these reliefs as a case study of, you know, both what can and cannot ultimately be done, right? I mean, even if we did very careful measurements of them and we were able to determine that these six must have come from one building, uh, and there's a building that 
would fit those dimensions and for which the iconography would be appropriate. And that building is located in a town very near the workshop at Oxyrin Casino, even if we could get it, you know, with that degree of precision, which would be very unlikely. But even if we could, uh, we would never be able to say for sure that that's what these were. That would be at best a hypothesis. Um, and we would need to be very careful to frame it as a hypothesis so that 50 years from now, nobody ever took that as a starting point and said, well, since we know that the Colgate pieces are from this town outside of Oxyrhynchus, we can therefore use that as evidence for these other pieces, uh, which is really what has happened in my field. I mean, hypothesis has been built upon hypothesis uh, to such an extent and for so many years that many people have lost track of how uncertain those foundations are. The title of my book on this is called Shaky Ground. <laughs> and I do think we're on shaky ground with yeah. a lot of a lot of things that we think we know much more definitively than we actually do.